you do hard time when the judge sentences you to life imprisonment because you've got to consider that we have all these inmates that will never see that front gate again. They are separated from their families. Uh, when the mom dies or dad dies, you know, if, if we can arrange it, we'll allow you to go to the funeral or, you know, we'll let you go visit them in the hospital, but probably not both. No Thanksgivings together, no Christmases together, all of those uh, family moments are spent over at the main prison visiting room or one of the out camp visiting rooms. When that inmate's family comes and visits and he sees his nephews, he sees his kids, he sees uh, his family members, then he has to go back through the shakedown room. The family members have to go back through the gate and leave the prison. Then that's punishment. Every time that transpires, that's punishment. The prison system that we have in this nation is usually a very oppressive system. It does not believe in grace, no in mercy, and the main objective is to punish and to protect the public, but not to really rehabilitate. I feel a, a weight on me that it, um, I hope the Lord processes in terms of power and not oppression. And the reason I feel such a weight is because I know most of you aren't, aren't leaving this place except to go to heaven. And that's heavy. It's got to be a, a battle lots of times. When I got off the bus and entered the gates of Angola, I didn't know what would the next day bring because I've never been in prison, never been incarcerated, never been in jail. So I didn't know anything about prison life. So I didn't think that I would even see the next day. And when I got here, all I seen was a bunch of guys working in the field. And I say, that's gonna be me. And I didn't know if I can do it or not. I only weighed 130 pounds, looked at young, because I was young, I was only 19 years of age at the time I came to Angola. And there's a lot of older guys that I was looking at like, man, I'm not gonna make it. And that's all I kept saying to myself, was I'm not going to make it. There is a sense in which your position here in prison, next stop heaven, makes it easier for you to get this message than for my people who are tempted every day to be idolaters with their freedom and their prosperity. My dome is, is, is very small, <laughs> considered uh, 64 people living in the dome uh, with four shower stalls between 64 people. My personal belongings go into uh, two boxes, probably about 20 inches deep and all of the personal belongings go into those two boxes. Anything else, uh, you, you just got to get rid of it. Uh, you can have four pair of shoes under your bed, and two blankets, and sheets, a pillow, <laughs> for you to sleep on, and, and it's, next person is like, probably, if I reach my arm out of my bed when I'm laying in it, I can pretty much touch the next person.
the average day here is basically the, the same day every day. In the morning, you, about six, about six o'clock, a quarter to six, they're gonna, they're gonna blow the whistle for us to go to, to eat breakfast. We go eat breakfast, probably spend about 30 minutes down there, come back to the dorm, clean up, probably brush your teeth. Then the next thing, they're gonna blow the whistle again for you to go to work. Every day, routine, every day, the same thing. The, I mean, it's, it's, you don't have to, you know, think of nothing different. It's just a routine thing every day. Here's the main point. Jesus did not come into the world mainly to give bread, but to be bread. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. He came into the world not to give bread, but to be bread. Now, he is going to give bread. And you can miss it. You can miss it by thinking that's the main thing he came to do. Give me the bread. But that's not the main reason he came. You've already had a lot of bread taken out of your hands. And I hope it lands on you with massive good news that he came to be bread, not mainly give bread. He's got to take bread out of a lot of people's hands so that they will trust him as the bread. I've been here 15 years. Uh, I came to prison at a relatively young age. So it was a lot of things that I never got to experience in life because I came to prison so young. I miss just being able to take a bath in the bathtub. You know, I miss making a paycheck. It wasn't nothing like having a check every Friday. I've been incarcerated in Angola for 19 years. And I mean, some of, the, some of the simplest things that, that when I was out in society and even people right now uh, take for granted, just, just being able to come out at night. That's, that's one of the things that I, I, lo I miss most, just coming out at night when it's cool and just walking out on the streets or in the yard somewhere and just kind of just looking off into the sky and being able to just have that peace of mind right there. I miss that. I miss. I miss being able to be in my room by myself. I miss just driving my car. I miss just coming home and leaving when I get ready. Not when somebody tell me to go to bed. Not, some, not when somebody t tell me put the light out. I miss being able to put my own light out, you know. I miss being able to have the privacy of taking a crap by myself. You know, without five other guys strung out on the side of me. Or being in the shower and everybody else is in the shower. Being able to go into the store and get what I want to get. I got to get what they provide. I might not like eating a certain type of cereal, but that's all they offer. I might want to pick something else. I miss the fact that I can't go to the ball game if I so choose. I just really miss not having a, the luxury and the liberty to do what I want when I want to do it. Uh, just being able to share time with my family. You know, Christmas is a season for me that I love. I love that time because that time represents family. For me, every, every Christmas, my family will come from all over the United States and we will spend time together, have family reunions, and I miss that. The thing that I would have to say that I miss the most is just not having the, the capability to really function in my role as a father. I remember when my son was 
you know, firstborn. He was the, the, the joy and pride of my life. I was there when he was delivered. You know, I spent every moment I had, you know, with him. I missed the opportunity of being a real father, being at my children's games. Uh, my son was a football player and a baseball player. I miss being at his games. My baby girl, she's, who's now going for a PhD, she, she graduated from Lehigh in Baton Rouge and she went to Southern and she graduated from Southern. She went back and got a master's. And I wasn't at any of those graduations. She was a cheerleader. She was at powerlifting meets. I wasn't at any of those things. Those little simple things that we take for granted in life is, is boys, is missed from the guys that are in prison. It's missed by me. Secondly, he did not come to be useful, but to be precious. Oh, how many Christians receive him as useful. Or another way to put it is, Jesus Christ did not come into the world to assist you in meeting desires you already had before you were born again. He came into the world to change your desires so that he's the main one. That's the reason he came. And so many preachers, maybe some have stood in this pulpit, and they have taken you right where you are with your desires, natural desires that you share with every fallen human being in the world and just say, Jesus came to meet that. Well, he didn't. Well, I lived in the projects. Uh, it was always something going on. It was routine to hear gunshots. It was routine to see guys on the corner selling drugs. It was you know, routine to see you know, uh, gang bangers you know, doing that thing or whatnot. But it was, a, it was just a negative environment. I mean, it was just an environment that didn't seem to have any hope. My senior year, I moved out with my mom. And when I moved out with my mom, that's when I basically seen my life taking a turn because there was no more discipline. You know, I had basically had the liberty to do whatever I wanted to do. You know, I made my own rules and I broke my own rules. So when the discipline left my life, that's when I started taking, you know, uh, the wrong path in life. As a young man, sometimes we have a tendency to think we're cool and the world evolves around us and our thoughts and our ideals, you know. And I thought all the focus should have been on me. And that's why when things happen, that are not in our focus and in our plan. We get disturbed and we, you know, we can be out of money, out of friends, out of uh, a place to stay, but we'll never be out of people to blame. And prison now has become the norm, uh, uh, especially for young African Americans. And, and right now, <laughs> young white males, they're flooding the prison as never before. You know, that was unheard of when I come here. They had one unit had, that housed the whites when I came here. Now they are everywhere. The, the temptations that, that I faced before coming to prison was, you know, the temptation of being involved with illegal activity of, of drugs, you know, being promiscuous, uh, this doing, this being rebellious uh, to parents, you know, these things, you know, that, that every, every teenager is faced with, 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 with some of those temptations depending on where you where you're raised at. And for me, the thing was was getting loaded, uh, smoking weed, you know, drinking. But when I would get around my parents, totally different attitude. You know, I, I can get preppy, I put on a little preppy look and you know, and I can I can, I was able to play the two roles back and forth. And I know a lot of kids do that. I mean you know, one minute you can get thugged out, then with, when your mom around, you can get prepped up and you can, you know, play the little clean role. And most parents, you know, we so naive sometimes, we think our kids never do anything wrong. 
1978, I was working for the Army Corps Engineers, and I owned the ballroom, Sid's place. And I went to an all-night party. I was also singing with a band, a young man who was doing fairly well. And I went to an all-night party, drinking Chevy's Rigor out the bottle and smoking weed, grade A red bud. And for the first time in my adult life, I snorted some cocaine. And it was a wild party. And when I, the next thing I knew, I was waking up in handcuffs. Guys in my neighborhood came on my birthday to get me, and I got in the car with them. And one thing led to another. And a couple of years later, I'm in prison. This is my first time ever uh, being incarcerated. I never got a traffic ticket prior to my incarceration. Nevertheless, one bad decision ultimately cost me the rest of my life. And that's what happens when we're disobedient, when we think mother and father don't have the answer, when we think we're big enough to have our own answers, when we won't obey, when we're disobedient, when nobody can tell us nothing, when we think we're a man. These are the type of pitfalls and potholes that we fall in and cripple us sometimes for life. Well, young man, <laughs> Welcome to Angola. And I'm glad that you're on this tour because I want you to see what prison life is all about. The guys at Camp J are in those cells 23 hours a day. There are things that go on in this cell that you don't want to be a part of because these guys sometimes will throw feces at each other. And this goes on sometimes for days. And if you're not careful, if you get too close, these guys will take a toothbrush and make a shank out of it and use it as a weapon. Because these are the minds that these guys have created being in these cells for so long. They think of ways to either hurt you or kill you. Although there are guys that have changed, but there are guys that have not changed. But you don't know which ones there are. And this is the stuff that you would be faced with if you make bad choices in your life and find yourself here. Because it's easy to get into trouble but it's so hard to get out of. my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. My brethren and my sisters, whereas death has once again invaded our ranks and removed from the walks of this life, our beloved Brother Quinn, 
his soul having departed to dwell in an undiscovered country from whose bond no traveler returns, it becomes our sad duty to commit his body to the grave. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And also our inspiring privilege to commit his soul to our maker, our redeemer, Jesus Christ. In the confident hope of the resurrection from the dead, in the glorious realms of life, let us pray. Jesus came into the world to bless us in some measure now. And I'll get to that in a minute from this very parable. But mainly, he's trying to forgive our sins, clothe us with righteousness, make himself our treasure, seal our eternity forever, and then put us to work in the world, whether we're in prison or on the outside. And the same reality is here as out there. The main thing is here. It's the other stuff feels real important. But that's why I said it may be that your very presence here will enable you to see better than the people in my church can see. They got the stuff. They just take it for granted. That's what it's about. And it's not what it's about. It's about him. I feel like I lost a lot of ground and a lot of years with my children. You know, my son looks at me and I can tell he doesn't see his father in the magnitude in which a son should see his father. When I see him, I saw myself at a young age because I met my father here in Angola and unfortunately my son had to meet me right here in Angola. So in the initial stages of my incarceration, you know, my dad came around, you know, he came visit me uh, pretty frequently, pretty often. and. Uh, I was really you know, inspired thinking that you know, even through you know, the situation, as, 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 as dark as it may seem, the good part about it, you know, it looked like I'd have got my dad back. It looked like he part, you know, wanted to start being a part of my life. And unfortunately, I think as the years got went on and things got more repetitious with me just being in prison, he got used to it. Uh, he and I had a disagreement uh, about something and rather than resolving like two men, like a father and a son, he just chose to run away from me. And uh, I hadn't spoken with him in maybe five years. I hadn't seen him in five years. And I'm kind of, I started, you know, building that same bitterness and resentment back up, to, you know, for him because like, you did what you did when I was a child. You just took off and ran away without any explanation. The more I reach out for you, the more you, kind of turn your back on me. So it's my relationship with my dad is what really motivates me to be in my son's life, to reach out to him, to try to build a relationship with, uh, with my daughter. I always said, you know, I never want to be like my dad. And ultimately, I ended up just like my dad in the exact same situation that he was in. I got married young. And then I got drafted in the military. But uh, I came back, I got three kids. Thank God that he's given them back to me, you know. It took a long time for me to get my baby back. And she literally hated me. And she told me that, you know. She said, Daddy, I hated you. I said, why? She said, because you abandoned me. You know, and she had a right to, because I had put my own selfish needs and desires above her future, you know and left her and my son and daughter, oldest daughter in, in the cold, you know. And I'm, I'm sitting in prison with a life center, you know, and, and, and bitterness had set in me because of all of this. I miss, uh, I love my kids, and I miss the time of being a father. The biggest challenge for me was overcoming 
failure to me. That was, that was my struggle because the reason why I say overcoming failure because I, I just had this, this condemnation on me that I had failed my parents. I had this like, throwed everything away just, just, just in a moment of time. And, and, and that was one of the things that I had to express to my parents when I, when I came here after I overcome that, I really share with them that they don't have to feel, you know, like they didn't do what they were supposed to do as parents because they did. And I wanted to free them up on it. I wanted them to know that, that what I did and the, the situation that I find myself in had absolutely nothing to do with the way that they raised me. I've been here 30 years, you know, and I understand prison life. And, and, and it's a dog life. Prison life is not a good life. I don't recommend prison to, to, to my cats and dogs. You understand? But because I'm here doesn't mean I have to be a cat or a dog. And a lot of you know, people in society, they just on a fast track, just living life you know, one day at a time and taking life at face value. But you know, in a situation like mine, having life taken away from me really made me appreciate life and really sit down and you know, put more value on life and some of the things that people think small to me now just mean the world to me. You know, I basically have to live my life through the Travel Channel, uh, going on vacation through the Travel Channel and watching reality shows and things of that nature. People waste their time in prison by trying to, to hold on to what they thought they was representing in society. And what I mean by that is you, people, people come to prison and, and what they were doing out there, the, the things that put them on the road to coming to prison. People try to carry out that same image uh, in prison. And it's, it's a waste of time because, I mean, you can't be what you was out there. I mean, and, and the reality of it is, or uh, common sense after you've been awakened was say, if that's what got me here, then certainly I don't want to continue to do the same thing that put me in the position that I'm in. You know, a lot of times people don't know how sorry you are for what you did, you know. They, they'll never get that opportunity, you know. 30 years, you know, and I had a chance to share with my mother and share with my children, you know, how sorry I am for the pain I've caused. But when you come to prison, your family's in prison. Your mother's in prison, your father, your sister, your brother, your sons and daughters are in prison with you. When my kids went to school and everybody else's father was there and they asked my kids, where's your father? They had to drop their head. In prison. Do not labor for the bread, for the food that perishes. That's just ordinary food. Don't labor for ordinary food that perishes. Don't make it your aim to get rich. Don't think mainly about the paycheck. Don't think mainly about upward mobility. Don't think mainly about the praise of men. Don't do your work for these kinds of reasons. Don't want to be satisfied with what this world can give. That's why I'm saying it may be, may be that many of you have a head start on this verse than the people outside. If the only hope we have is in this life, in Cadillacs and cars and bling bling and, and, and whatever, you know, if our hope is in these things, if our hope is in money, if our hope is in, 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 in whatever, drugs, alcohol, if our hope is in making it big, come on, come on. I, I knew the rich man in the Bible who made it big, you know, and he said, my God, I fared sumptuously, you know, what shall I do? I know what I'll do, I'll build me bigger bonds. You know, didn't want to give away anything, but the Bible declares that a voice come out and say, Thou fool this night, thy soul is required of thee. See, we don't have time to play. I'm not wasting my life sentence because I actually feel as if I, my life has purpose. And I think that's the first thing that made me realize that life was worth living, even in the situation and circumstances, you know, that I was in. I have more liberty now in prison than I had on, on the streets, and that may sound crazy. Am I telling you that I, would, I like being in prison? Absolutely not. 
but I developed a relationship with, you know, Christ in prison. So, you know, in Christ there's liberty. I was raised in church, you know, and I knew church call. I knew altar call, protocol, but I didn't know Jesus. I didn't know Jesus. It was here in this prison where Jesus Christ, you know, became a reality to me, you know. And I'll share this anywhere. You know, it was here in this prison. And I thank God. I, you know, I'm sad and sorry that I had to come here. But, you know, coming to the knowledge of truth and, and understanding and knowing Jesus Christ the way I do now, I appreciate it. And I appreciate it highly. Consistently say that. Lord, give me your love, give me your joy, and give me your peace for this day. Because I know that this day is bringing a lot of things uh, even though it's routine, but it's bringing a lot of different angles, a lot of different uh, personalities, a lot of different people that I'm going to come in contact with. And I want to be able to represent because that's who I am now. I'm a believer and I want to be able to represent the kingdom properly. I want to be able to represent it correctly. I don't want to be a stumbling block for anyone. Every time, you know, I, I think about my kids, I realize that, you know, I still I still have a purpose. You know, God put me here to still try to mentor to them and try to change their lives and change other people's lives. So that's what really wakes me up in the morning, knowing that I still do have a purpose, even in the situation I am, as dim and bleak as it may seem. You know, uh, I just look for God for strength and just say, you know, just keep giving me the strength to persevere and look for tomorrow. And hopefully, you know, tomorrow I can make an impact on somebody else's life that may eventually keep them from making some of the bad decisions that I made in life. Life will soon be over. We don't know where death is. So it's incumbent upon us to know that we know Jesus because only then can we have a show, secure, eternal security. Just the other day, I buried a young man 35 years old. You know, death has no age barrier. Death doesn't care about race, creed, or color. <laughs> you know, death don't care how old you are. See, we don't have time to play. And one of the scriptures that really blessed me, uh, the Bible say that, for, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. The joy was on the other side of the cross. You know, in order for me to have true joy, I have to strain and strive and reach like Paul said, I have to press to get on the other side of this cross that I'm bearing, this cross that I'm carrying. You know, Jesus said, if any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. In ancient Rome, when a man took up his cross, you know, he had already said goodbye to his family. He had said goodbye to his friend, goodbye to his loved one, you know. And when we take up the cross of Christ, we're saying goodbye to sin, goodbye to lying, goodbye to homonging, goodbye to gambling. Goodbye to the murder, goodbye to rape, goodbye to robbery. You know, I'm not coming back to you anymore. Paul says, I count everything as loss for the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, that I may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, if by any means I might attain the resurrection of the dead. Next stop after Angola, heaven. If he's precious, if he's precious beyond anything in this world that you've already had to lose. I know him. I know he's real, you know, and, and that, I think that's the apex of my life, just knowing Jesus, you know. And if it had not been for this experience, I may have never known him. I may have died out there in my sin, you know, living a wicked life. Jesus said, what is it a man gain the world but yet forfeit his own soul? So... That alone is basically telling us that all the achievements that we get in this lifetime, all the awards that we may win, all the monetary gain we may seek, all the uh, women we may conquer, doesn't amount to anything if we're not in relationship with God because that's what's ultimately going to count. Even in this place, even with the desire to be free, we still can live a complete life because whether in prison or out, the only completeness of life is in Christ. That's, I mean, that's the only complete. You could be free, but if you're not in Christ, then you're not complete. My name is Keith Jamal Morris. My charge is first degree murder. 
I'm currently serving a life sentence without probation, parole, or suspended sentence. I've been in Angola for 15 years. I'm 33 years old. My full name is Ron Christopher Hicks. My charge is second degree murder. My sentence is life in prison without the benefits of parole or probation or suspension of sentence. My full name is Sidney Deloach Jr. I'm charged with rape. I have a life sentence without the benefit of probation, parole, or suspension of sentence. But I want to take advantage of this life while I have it because I understand that it's only in this life what I do for Christ that's going to make any difference, that's going to count, that's going to mean anything. Everything else is going to perish. Everything else going down but the Word of God. Grace through faith. I talked to a cat the other day, and he was like, man, I really want to come to Christ, but I got to clean my life up first, get my sins together. I told him, I used to think that way too. I thought I had to change myself before I could come to Christ. But Christ changed me. Let me tell you my story starts like this. It's 546 in the morning, tossing and turning, chest burning. Sermons in my head keep reoccurring. Having visions in my head of a kid. Crying at the feet of the father for all the wrong things that he did. Now I'm sweating in my sheets, can't sleep. My mind keeps telling me I'm six feet deep. Don't remind me, even though I'm still alive, I can't tell. The way I'm living my life, I feel I'm going to hell. God, they telling me I should accept you, that you had to leave the world because the world left you. Reason I can't change like a mystery to me So I make believe there really is a heaven for a G Even though they say you love the world so much You shed your blood, God I feel I'm too messed up for love They tell me come as I am, but I smell like smoke My whole life's full of sin, cause it's all I know The Bible told me that you died for my sins If I believe in Christ, to save me from the end But I'm scared to ask you to save me My heart's so evil, I got thoughts that's full of hatred Hurting people, I thought that first I had to clean up my life My life is a mess. Will you take me as I am? Will you take me as I am? I know the way I'm living is wrong, but I can't change on my own. Trying to make it alone. I wonder how could you love me when my life's so ugly? But you came down and died for me. Will you take me as I am? I know the way I'm living is wrong, but I can't change on my own. Trying to make it alone. I wonder how could you love me?